All right, so here we are for another <coughs> edition of the Weekly Sonneteer. Um, la last week, <coughs> the last episode, we looked at a poem called Wild Peaches by Eleanor Wiley. And although, although you might miss it easily because it's only referenced in the first line, <coughs> the, the poem that the backdrop of the poem is, sorry, <clears throat> is the end of the world. So, I mean, it, it, given the time period it's written in, it's probably not a post-apocalyptic vision of the world. Uh, it I mean, it's not like, it is post-apocalyptic in a sense. It's, you know, society has crashed and it's this girl and her her guy you know they're they're going off to live in the woods <clears throat> and and of course after the first line the the poem is so lighthearted and whimsical that you know unless you were really paying attention you might just you might completely miss that you know the poem is about the end of the world but the poem that we're going to look at today, you wouldn't miss the point. For, for one thing, the poem is titled The End of the World, okay? <clears throat> but, um, uh, and, and again, by way of introduction in case, well, you know, hopefully you've, you've listened to the, uh, the previous talks, but, but again, the, the idea of this uh, series of, of videos that this channel is looking at sonnets as, as something that, you know, um, in our, in, in contemporary America, you know, and, and, uh, Europe, I guess, Canada, um, these days we're trying, you know, 21st century poetry, we're trying to do away with form, right? That really started in the 20th century. It's just this idea of getting rid of traditional poetic structures and just, you know, spilling your emotions, your thoughts onto the page and <clears throat> trying to come up with new structures or trying to, uh, again, you can't really, it's a bit naive to think we can do away with form and structure in poetry, that we can just be free because, you know, ultimately, um, e even having a written language ties us down to something, no matter how hard we try and get away with it, there's always structure or there's no meaning. You know, um, to, to have meaning, to communicate in any, you know, uh, <clears throat> meaningful way, we, we have to have structure. And the sonnets, despite um, some people's wanting to do away with the sonnet, you know, uh, because uh, f for a number of reasons, it still really persists. You know, some of my uh, <clears throat> some of my favorite sonnets are <clears throat> written by people in the Hispanic community, the African American community, <clears throat> and so it's something that uh, many people across all different kind of cultures, genders, love and appreciate still, and are trying to work within, even though you know sometimes they flaunt certain traditional aspects of a sonnet. <clears throat> like, they don't always rhyme it anymore. As I believe the sonnet we're going to look at today doesn't rhyme. And they don't always stick to that iambic pentameter, which is basically where each line traditionally follows this pattern we've talked about of da-da, 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 da-da. Each line is da-da, 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 da-da. Um... <clears throat> And, and so, uh, usually, you know, the, the requirement of having 14 lines is something that even when, uh, even when we do away with every other aspect of a sonnet, we hold on to the 14 lines. But even then, there are people who are, who are like, well, we're, we're even going to do away with the 14 lines and call it a sonnet. And... I probably will not never break that boundary in this this series because, you know, you've got to have something that you hold on to or or why bother calling it a sonnet anymore, you know? Um, and so as as most people do, I, I'm, I'll stick to 14 lines as, as we go with these. 
But um, <clears throat> so with with some preliminary thoughts, and I've talked about those things before. Um, we are, you know, uh, one other thing, one other thing that I want to mention that I've talked about some before is there's there's two traditional types of sonnets. One is a Shakespearean sonnet, which that was week one. We talked about, you know, well, in week two, I talked about how the sonnet we did in week one was a Shakespearean sonnet because I forgot to talk that, about that in week one. And then in week two, we looked at something which is called a Petrarchan sonnet. And I won't talk about Shakespeare, Shakespearean sonnet today. Um, but we are going to look at the Petrarchan sonnet again today. And so just as a reminder, a Petrarchan sonnet, like the biggest uh, thing that characterizes a Petrarchan sonnet is your, your sonnet is kind of divided into two different sections. And the first section is eight lines. The second section is six lines. Some poets go so far as to put a space in between those two sections to be like, hello, look, I'm writing an, a Petrarchan or an Italian sonnet, as it's sometimes called, because Petrarch, Petrarch was Italian. And so it's that idea of you've got these two sections or even two stanzas sometimes of eight lines and then six lines. <clears throat> and... <clears throat> And, and the two sections are doing something different. And so we'll look at that with today's sonnet. Okay, let's, enough talk, let's get to the sonnet. Uh, as, you know, I kind of like to read these at least twice because as I've said, you know, when people tell me they don't like to read poetry or they didn't get a poem, I usually ask, my first question is, well, how, how many times do you usually read a poem? You know, because they're like, I don't get poetry. I'm like, how many times do you actually read the poem? Uh, and I usually read a poem at least three or four times, you know, if I think it's at all worth reading. Uh, and so I, I'll, I'll probably usually read these a sonnet twice when, when I introduce one. All right. So uh, today's sonnet, and you can find the link right there below the video to the sonnet if you want to read along with us, um, with me. But today's sonnet is a one call one by a poet named Archibald McLeish, who, as you can read there, was born in 1892. Um, and so the sonnet is called The End of the World. Quite unexpectedly, as Vassaro, the armless ambidextrian, was lighting a match between his great and second toe, and Ralph the lion was engaged in biting the neck of Madame Saussman, while the drum pointed, and Teeny was about to cough in waltz time, swinging Jocko by the thumb, quite unexpectedly, the top blew off. And there, there overhead, there, there hung over those thousands of white faces, those dazed eyes, there in the starless dark, the poise, the hover, there with vast wings across the canceled skies, there in the sudden blackness, the black pall of nothing, 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 nothing at all. All right, I'll read it again. The end of the world. Quite unexpectedly, as Vassaro the armless ambidextrian was lighting a match between his great and second toe, and Ralph the lion was engaged in biting the neck of Madame Sussman while the drum pointed, and Teeny was about to cough and waltz time swinging Jocko by the thumb. Quite unexpectedly, the top blew off. <clears throat> and there, there overhead, there, there hung over those thousands of white faces, those dazed eyes, there in the starless dark, the poise, the hover, there with vast wings across the canceled skies, there in the sudden blackness, the black pall of nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing at all. All right, let's un uh, let's let's unpack this poem line by line. <clears throat> the end of the world. He's he's very upfront with it. You're not getting lost here, like again you might have in the poem uh, the week before, um, "Wild Peaches" by Eleanor Wiley. 
Uh, her point is not that it's the end of the world, it's everything else she's talking about, right? But here you've got it, the end of the world. Um, quite unexpectedly, not, nobody, when, when the end of the world happens, you know, as many post-apocalyptic movies as you may have watched, probably most of us are not going to see it coming. You know, it's going to slap us upside the head. Um, as Vassaro, the armless ambidextrian, so he's a guy... He's pretty talented, you know, he's ambidextrous, but with, with no arms. How do you be ambidextrous with no arms, right? As he was lighting a match between his great and second toe, okay? So, so he can light, you know, he can light matches with his toes. That's, that's pretty impressive, you know? So he's ambidextrous with his, with his toes, um, conceivably with his feet, not, not with his arms, his hands, which he, he doesn't have, right? And, and Ralph, a lion. So you've got an ambidextrous dude with no arms. You've got Ralph, a lion, biting this woman, this French lady, lady Madame Saussman, on the neck, right? You've got somebody playing a drum. <clears throat> you've got this dude named Teeny who's, like, trying to cover his mouth with one hand because he's about to cough as as somebody's playing waltz music, you know, or, or in time to like waltz music, you know, so this is like, kind of like, you know, he's following a tune, whether in his head or, or I think it's the tune of the drum, right? So if somebody's playing waltz time with the drum, you know, playing a beat with the drum, um, this dude Teeny, uh, in, in mid cough is also swinging a guy named Jocko around by the thumb right? And it's like, you know, what the heck is all this talking about? Well, let's go back through it. You know, we got an ambidextrous guy, a dude doing a trick with his toes, a lion, you know, pretend biting, I imagine, or, or maybe real, uh, a lady named Madame Saussman, and a guy swinging somebody around. This, you know, and this is one of those things you would have to read the line between the lines. This is talking about a circus. Maybe you already got that, right? Jocko is a monkey. Um, and he's being swung around by his thumb by a clown named Teeny. Um, hopefully, Madame Sussman is not really getting bitten on the neck. But this has happened in circuses where, where people have died or been paralyzed by, you know, the lion tamer or the tiger tamer is not paying attention and the thing comes up behind him and grabs his neck. You know, but hopefully it's part of the act, you know, um, and not a tragic accident in the middle of a circus, right? And you've got the ambidextrous guy who's got this impressive side act. So he's in the circus too. So this is all describing a circus, you know. Bunch of people just enjoying themselves, just watching a circus, right? And then the unexpected happens. As the end of the world would be. We won't be sitting out in lawn chairs looking up, watching the asteroid come, you know. It'll come when we're watching a movie, you know, or brushing our teeth. Or sitting there watching a circus. Quite unexpectedly, the top blew off. Uh, when, I've, when I've taught this in classes sometimes, this poem, some students have suggested, like, whatever the end of the world is, it blows the top of the tent off, you know? And then, and then like, you know, we're looking up at the nuclear, at the mushroom cloud or, or whatever, right? Um, or, or the, the cloud from the exploding volcano, you know, the ash, they're spreading over our heads, whatever it is, right? Uh, McLeish doesn't specify how the world is ending. So then you switch into your second stanza here, and he puts a space to let you know this is an Italian sonnet, you know, or a Petrarchan sonnet, right? And, um, but, but also, to just make it clear that he's switching top, I mean, he's going to talk about a different aspect of this now, and that is the Italian sonnet, right? Is is between this eight line and this six line stanza, you know, what we switch themes. Uh, in the last poem, Wild Peaches, um, it in the, when it switches to the second 
part of the poem to those last six lines, she switches from just talking randomly about what they're going to do in the woods when they go to live off the land to talking specifically in the last six lines about, about the seasons, what the seasons, the four seasons will be like in the woods. And here McLeish switches from talking about the circus and, and what people are doing when the end of the world happens to talking about what the end of the world is like. You know, first stanza, what were people doing before it happened? What were people doing when it hit? Second stanza, what does the end of the world look like, right? And so there, there overhead, there hung over those thousands of white faces. So everybody's gazing up at it, you know, and their faces are pale white. They're like, oh my gosh, right? Their eyes are dazed. Deer in the headlights. What has just happened, right? They're in the starless dark because something is covering the sky in ash, in cloud, in whatever, right? Something is hovering over them. They're with vast wings across the canceled sky. It's a metaphor, right? Um, he's, he's comparing, you know, this what's over their heads to a giant bird, right? To some giant black eagle or something or that's, that's covering the skies. It's canceling out the stars. All they can see is the darkness of it, right? There with vast wings, that, that metaphor of the bird or something, some giant creature with wings across the canceled skies. The skies have been canceled. They're no more, right? Um, unfortunately, you know, you might get the wrong perspective on this one because we've everybody, when they think canceled, they think cancel cultures these days, right? Which there is a similarity, but cancel is just done away with, right? The canceled skies, there in the sudden blackness, the black pall, it's got all these great metaphors, right? A pall is what you cover somebody's body with when they die, right? It's the black sheet that is pulled over them when they've died. Um, and so the black pall of nothing, it's the end of the world. Everything's over, there's nothing left, right? Um, and yeah, and, and again, maybe the most the most obvious thing about this section, second stanza is the repetition, right? There, 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 you know, it's like he's like, everybody look, look, right? Um, and then that last line, nothing, nothing, there's nothing, you know? Um, and so it's, it's hard to get away with this. You know, I mean, honestly, I think this is, you know, the repetition in this second stanza is one of those things that like sticks out the most about why this is such an impressive sonnet is because McLeish can get away with this, you know? Um, yeah, this much repetition, there's, it can kill a point. It can be like, dude, I, I get it. And, and you're just being lame with all this repetition. You know, but but not McLeish. It works. You know, because if this had really happened and we were all lying there in our you know, lawn chairs staring up together or at, you know, at the end of the world, which nobody, none of us saw coming, we would all be like pointing at it and being like, there, look at that, you know, but, but without saying anything because we're just speechless, right? Um, and ultimately, you've got nothing left to say about it. There's just nothing, you know, the world's come to an end. So, yeah. So, that, that is uh, the, the End of the World by Archibald McLeish. And, um, you know, at the end here, uh, just as a reminder, I, I like likes. Everyone likes to, to have somebody click and say like. But much more than that, you know, I, I'd appreciate your thoughts, on these talks, your, your, your written talks, if, you know, this inspires or any, in anything, or if it makes you think of other poems, you want to slap down there with the link, you know, whatever. Um, thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.